uh, last week we we had an overview of uh, modelings of the things and how to make a reasoning about modelings and everything. Uh, today we we go a little bit more uh, in deep about uh, define your model family and how to make a model with R. Then we we will have two more lessons, <laughs> two more sessions of our book club about modeling. So plenty of time for learning better. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to recap a bit of mathematics and say that our model is a function of the observed data. So we can identify uh, y equals to a function. And this is what we aim to achieve. So we want to replicate our observations with a function at the, in, in the best way um, as possible. So the function um, is made of some coefficients and predictors. And so the function is made with beta zero and beta one or more than one uh, coefficients and predictors if we have more. But for now, we start from the, from the basics. So we hypothesize that we have one outcome and one predictor. So when we make a model, we attempt to replicate uh, y equals to our function fx by applying mathematical models to our, our observed data. The final objective could be the prediction of an outcome, for example, but we, we can just have uh, uh, as objective um, just to explore the data and analyze them, see how they behave, but not necessarily we need to make a prediction. So when we apply the model, we, our, uh, the, the results that we, um, of our model is this uh, y hat. The y hat is the result of our model and these values, because they can be more than one, uh, contain some noise or residuals or residual values, which make the model to be slightly different from real values. So we make the model. So we want to achieve this. We make the model and we achieve um, uh, something similar, but with a difference. So with some noise. So the resi or, or residuals, so there's some different uh, terms to, to define this epsilon here. So the residuals, as we define here, are identified by the difference between y, so our real y, our real uh, observation, and uh, our y hat. So what, uh, what we want is to reduce as much as possible this amount of residual by selecting different type of models and assessing them on different parameter levels. For this purpose, we use some metrics to identify the residual levels and then make further investigations. So these metrics are like uh, the R squared, the adjusted R squared, the residual sum of squared and others. If you are curious about how to make this um, mathematical uh, formulation with R Markdown, you can um, follow this, this link and then um, you will find the notes. Um, and, and then I'll show you, I'll put this in the, in the chat maybe, that, that's the best way. And then we'll talk about it later. So here um, I want to just a little bit go back to model R package uh, that we have seen last time, uh, last week. And to add um, like uh, a curiosity, uh, which can be, can, can be useful with this package manipulate. So we just uh, replicate the same things that we did it uh, last week. 
with uh, model R package, we use SIM1 data. We make a simple linear model and then we do the visualization with the GeomSmooth method LM. Okay. Um, if we use manipulate function from the manipulate uh, package, we can play around with this with this data, trying to uh, assess the level of the slope in a way that can identify the model line. In fact, if we see this, uh, we we can see that if I use this function, and this function is for uh, from uh, the manipulate package, uh, I uh, this is my plot, okay? So as you can see, okay, this is my plot. The one I've just, um, Okay, this is my plot. But now if I, uh, to this plot, uh, uh, I put this plot inside this manipulate function. Okay, and this, we can have a look at the function as well here. And it says that it, uh, it's able to create an iterative plot. Uh, so I put inside my plot with, uh, an addition, okay, which is a couple of addition, a geom upline, um, and uh, which takes consideration of the coefficients of my mod, from my model, and a slope with a variable, okay, and then I define the variable here with a slider. So if I run this function, you can see that I have oh, Obtain the same thing as before, but I have one more uh, linear line here and this um, uh, nice thing here where I can adjust my line to different levels. So for example, I can, um, I've uh, done it uh, easily with this slider. I set the mean and the max value with the step uh, from one to three, I want step of uh, no power one. So I can uh, turn this, this wheel <laughs> uh, and adjust my line to uh, certain values in a way that can um, uh, achieve the... Um, uh, so the the the, what, what, the 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 main line, okay. So I go back uh, there. I don't know if you have any questions. So that 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 can be um, customized as well as you like, uh, and it's it turns out to be very useful. Okay. So. I go back where Federica, I was. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So, when is sure. this useful? When would you want to play manually around with adjusting the slope? You, um, uh, if you if you want to, for example, do non-parametric analysis, and you 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 not necessarily need a, a linear line, but you might want to analyze, I don't know, the density or compare if. Uh, um, a density function is uh, close to a normal uh, density. Uh, you can do many things. Um, mm, okay. in, inside you put your uh, plot and then uh, assure that you have a variable that can be, uh, it can vary mm -hmm. within a certain values and then you add the slider. You, you can find the documentation uh, as always with a question mark and manipulate in mm -hmm. uh, having, having loaded the package. 
uh, and it tends to be useful. It's like Plotly, I don't know, there's other packages for making iterative um, visualization, but this one is uh, made on purpose for statistics. So maybe mm, I see. can be useful. Thank you. Uh, sure. Okay. So what we want to, we need to think about that, um, that we have two main, so, differentiation within models. So linear models and non-linear models. Linear models, we know that uh, it's uh, assume a relationship of this form and uh, that the residuals, so the noises that we have just talked, uh, so the distances between the observed and the predicted values are generally normal distributed. So I have a normal distribution. In R, within R, you can uh, apply, uh, there are um, different types of linear models with these functions. So we know that LM is for linear models. We can use GLM for generalized linear model or GAM for generalized additive models, GlimNet for penalized linear models, uh, robust linear models and so on and so forth. So these are the packages uh, um, for, for using these things. While non-linear models are models with a non-linear trend. So there are some models that require predictors that have been centered and scaled, such as neural networks, key, uh, nearest neighbors and support vector machines. Okay, so um, obviously we start with a linear model. This is the, 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 the point to start, but then we can make transformations. How do we make transformation? So we can switch between linear and nonlinear model with some transformations, okay? Um, for example, if I want to weight my regression, uh, I can, add to my model here, weights equal to one of the predictors we identify uh, as a weight. And I want them identified as a weight within my linear model. So, or I can do a polynomial transformation with uh, poly and it makes a polynomial. Uh, and I can define the, the level. So this is a third level polynomial. Uh, the, 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 the basic linear model uh, is a polynomial of uh, order one. Uh, polynomial of order two is a squared. Uh, I do square X or this is a polynomial order three and so on you can make different. Uh, polynomial for different orders. Or we can use splines. For this, you need to load, uh, have this package, splines, and you can use this function, bs. Uh, and as well, you can set up uh, the order of the spline. So as I didn't mention about the plots because the, the plots are all the same just the, 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 the things that varies is the, the model. And then uh, I attach it, uh, all the three model with patchwork. And you can see that this is the linear model. This is the polynomial transformation. This is the spline. There is a slightly difference. And then you can uh, think about what would be the best and add some order, decrease some orders switch within polynomial and splines and so on and so forth. I have a question. What's a spline? A spline is a function that adjusts um, uh, uh, as much as possible to your data. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's, it's not uh, um, a polynomial, just a polynomial transformation, but it takes care of the, the mean values. Okay. So it's a, it's a difference between um, the, the observed value and your prediction, but then proportionate to 
the difference between uh, the um, uh, outcome. Uh, so it, it's it's a uh, uh, but to be precise, you know, we can uh, just have a look at splines um, here and see if we have some um, uh, uh, some little information. Uh, lines and BS, uh, then I'll share. Okay. Okay, so this is a bit spline basis for polynomial spline. Uh, details say uh, that this BS is based on the function spline design and it generates a basis matrix for representing the family of piecewise polynomials with specified interior dots and uh, knots and degree. The, uh, yeah, the okay. piecewise polynomials is the key part of it. Splines are a way to model the data like a little bit at a time. So you, you okay. have a, a different different equation for, you know, maybe um, uh, like under 18 of, you know, age under 18 might have one model. So that would be one piece of the spline. And then maybe like 18 to 24 is another model and whatever. So it finds the pieces and then smoothly puts them together. Um, okay. And yeah, if you and want all the details about splines, um, the ISLR book club goes into them quite a bit. So that would be a place to learn more. Um, okay. I think the feature engineering club that hasn't started yet, I think that's probably going to go into splines quite a bit too. Um, right. I feel that this is so way beyond what I need to do. <laughs> like the, the amount that uh Hadley just kind of mentions them in passing in the chapter okay. and mm -hmm. knowing that much to like kind of be able to put them in mm -hmm. without necessarily fully understanding them is probably enough at this point right. if you look at it right. like he has some some of the plots where he shows different levels of splines and mm -hmm. splines splines can be dangerous because um <laughs> Towards the end of the chapter, it's in 23.4, he shows a, a, the model where it's like exactly fitting the data, which maybe that's mm -hmm. right, but maybe mm -hmm. that's just that particular set of data. Right. And so yeah, you have to be careful about, wondering. yeah, you have to be careful how much uh, freedom you give the spline to yeah. like really fit into the data. Um, mm -hmm. But right. on the other hand, especially if you've got some you know, like I was saying with the ages or something like that, where there's a logical reason that the model would change for different, mm -hmm. like it would be a completely different model at va different values of some certain variable, then yeah, it can make sense to let it do that. And then, you know, the, the nice thing is splines, when you are using these spline functions, um, they help to kind of figure out if that is true. And then you use you know, oh. modeling techniques to um, validate whether your model still makes sense and holds for you know, uh, data outside of the training data and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. They, they turns out to be very useful uh, because sometimes they, they the best way to uh, find a model which is very close to, to what what you're searching. Okay, when you fit the model, uh, you apply the estimate um, of the coefficients uh, um, of your observed data to the model. So in fact, um, for example, if we think a very simple model, uh, we have this y and the two coefficients with a predictor, when we fit the model, we apply the numbers to our variables. So what R does is to assign the estimates 
of the co coefficient to our uh, predictors. So the conversion of the linear model formula, this y tilde x, is in, in this very basic case equals to this. And behind the scene, what happens is that uh, R makes a function uh, of this kind for, for a linear model, for example. And um, so you have this A1 and the data, so the, with the predictor uh, times A2 plus another one more term. So here I didn't add the, the A3, but in case you have one more term. And uh, we can see it with the function model matrix, what happens uh, inside. So we, this is uh, the function. And then we go. Model, yeah. one, one second, I'm sorry. Can you, um, so right there where you have a model one function A data, right? So the A bracket one is your coefficient, right? And then yeah. the data X is just the data for with a column X and then multiply it by that second coefficient, right? Yes. And then, but this A3, why are you not multiplying by data at or column X? Exactly. Uh, this is uh, um, an example. Okay. To um, uh, just to show what uh, uh, happens when you apply um, the LM function, but it's not only that, okay? Because then mm -hmm. it's a bit more complicated. But to let you understand, uh, to let us understand what happens behind uh, when we make a model, um, th there is a function. Uh, of some uh, coefficients and some data. So this A3 should have uh, uh, one more predictor or mm -hmm. um, can be used like that as well because then these two sum up. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, maybe I was just looking too much into it or something. Yeah, yeah. version of it is from an exercise that he has and, um, you know, it's meant to be confusing in that case. That, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because okay. it's what you would really be optimizing is like the sum of A1 and A3. So you might as well think of that as A1. Um, oh, I see, okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as written, oh. that would that would be a weird case. <laughs> okay, okay. But Great, then, yeah, but then with this modern matrix function, uh, and for example, we, we use uh, our SIM3 data set uh, from the model R package, which are simulated da uh, data. And um, with the formula for the model, we can see what happens. Um, so he set the information that we have provided uh, has to be an intercept and a predictor with this name with the same name and then it works on this data on this matrix and and this is to to visualize what if if we make modification to our formula we see this change okay uh, for example, um, I, I like to mention this as well. For example, if the, there's, uh, there's some condition for which we can uh, add the formula and then add minus one, for example, and that will turn out that it takes, a, um, get a read of uh, the intercept. This is a um, first level modeling. So when we analyze the average of, of our predictors, so we can uh, set up a, an initial formula for our model, say y tilde our predictor x1 in this case, then minus one, and then the, the function will release the average of our pred, uh, predictor. Okay. 
um, then uh, if we, our purpose is to make a prediction, we can make a prediction with our model. So let's say that we, again, um, do the LM function. Um, these are the coefficients for this simulated data. And then uh, we want to make a prediction. To make a prediction, uh, you know, all models are, go are good, <laughs> but no one is perfect. So we want to test our model on new data, because if you test your model on your observations, it might turn to be good. But if you test on different data, on new data, uh, you might find differences. So in this case, we, we use data grid function and it builds a grid. That means a matrix, a sort of matrix. So a list of numbers or more than one uh, list. So a grid, okay, of value. In this case for uh, variable uh, X, so our predictor to uh, make a selection of our data. So basically makes a random data of this uh, um, variable. Okay, we can switch to R to see this. So maybe a bit clearer. Okay, so here we are. So we have this model and we, we ask for the coefficients and then we use data grid and with data grid, um, uh, with this syntax, we obtain new data. So our uh, predictor, but with new information, let's say, okay? So then we use this uh, grid uh, with add prediction function to extrapolate the prediction from our model and uh, column bind, it does automatically uh, with our new data. And here you can see that we have our data. This is just the add, so the first six rows and then the, 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 the prediction values. So then we can uh, make the difference between the prediction and our observation to, to see, uh, to, to find the residuals. Okay. In fact, if I um, do a, a visualization of this, um, data pred, these predictions, this tend to be exactly, um, so just uh, our uh, linear model. Okay, I, I have more questions. I'm yes, sorry. they, they um, overlap. So if I do sites two, I think we can see it. So they overlap. Okay, exactly. I, I have a sort of basic question. So, um, Say that I have, like in biology, oftentimes you can go as low as uh, N of three for samples, right? In a control and in a treatment group. And you've applied some drug, right? To see how cells respond. And so um, in that case, I guess I could simulate um, a new data set, you know, to use my model to see if there's statistical differences between the treatment and the control condition. Um, probably just from a normal distribution. And then, um, you know, with the average and standard deviation set by, yeah. you know, my control or treatment group, and then use that, I guess, to test, you know, my model mm -hmm. and see, um, I guess in that case, like, when would the model be very different in, you know, a new, a new data set, unless I had tons of outliers, you know, in, in my original, data set. So I'm just trying to, you know, wrap my head around as to why I would want to generate or simulate a new data set to test the model as opposed to, you know, just running my experiment again and then having that as a replicate. 
Um, yeah. I, I would say like this chapter is very, um, it, it's, it is simulated E to make the data work to show us things. I don't, okay. Okay. You know, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I might, I might take different draws of data, but I, I wouldn't <laughs> simulate data in a, any real context that I can think of. Um, right, 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 right. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you can think you can think of that. Uh, for example, if you are uh, analyze this um, um, uh, biological data and then you want to identify the outcome for uh, some drugs, and and you make a study with controls and uh, um, and everything, then you 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 have all your data, so you mm -hmm. you. Uh, the only things that you might want to investigate is what happens if uh, you have new observations. Mm. No, this happens when you make a model that would be workable, even when you have new observations. So if you test more patients and they have different, um, I don't know, like uh, biological data or different uh, outcomes with use or not use of this um, um, drug, you can uh, uh, test uh, simulating a new data, your model, which will turn out to be very workable even for new data or not. Yeah, that would make sense. That's the other scenario that I was thinking that um... I was thinking some assays sometimes only work in a specific range, but also there just might not be experimental in a way to get through that. But if you could extend the model beyond the range and have it be predictive, that would be useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. that, but that is always, you know, that is always dangerous because you don't know, like. Yes. Yes, this, this is very true. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, you know, you have a beautifully fit line within a range of, you know, like X values that doesn't really hold beyond that. And that's why the assay only measures, you know, within right. a certain range anyway. So, yeah. Okay. So the same, the same way we can uh, uh, find the residuals. Uh, this time we do not, we don't add them to the grid. Uh, but we add them uh, uh, to the uh, receipts, um, to the data, original data. So in a way that we have these are our uh, this is our response variable. So the, the the variable that we aim to predict, and these are the residuals. So if we sum these two. Uh, or we do the difference. So we obtain the y hat, so our prediction. Made on, obs uh, on our observation. Okay. Uh, then, so uh, one thing that you need to do is investigate the residuals and, and the uh, distribution. So a nice visualization, this, I found this very nice. Nice visualization is uh, uh, this geom ref line, which split the canvas in two parts. You can set if it's on zero or other values because the, the residual should be like uh, quite normal. So some on a, on a side and the same on the other side. Okay, so last week we mentioned about interaction and this is when we uh, do more investigations. We need more investigations such as, I don't know, you use drug uh, control, tier control uh, model analysis and then you realize that when you make your first model, um, I, you know, you, you see that age and sex are, uh, have uh, released different results if you use it separately and then together again, there is a different result. So you think about uh, maybe there's, there's some interaction within them. 
so you need to uh, more do more investigation and you use this interaction things. Uh, it's enough that you just, we, we said last time, you that times the, the, the predictors because automatically he does the plus and then the, the multiplication. So this is nice as well because um, in this case, we make a comparison of the two models, the one with without interaction, the one with interaction with this function, gather predictions. So it, it um, lists uh, all the prediction for both models. So it put one uh, behind the other. And then you can plot them. So with a visualization and you have a set wrap. So you can see that model one has this release this visualization, model two is the other way. So these are simulated data, but we can speculate uh, and say these are more linear, tending to decrease. And this this other one uh, identifies some um, deficiencies, so, you know, the interaction terms is the model two. Then as, as well, we can use gather residuals when we have uh, two models or more than two models so that we can um, identify uh, what are the residuals for the two models and how they behave. If we can speculate which one of the two is the best model. And then finally, for example, this they, I found this this very nice. This is the last uh, things of the chapter. Uh, so um, here there is a simulation of this data uh, made with a um, uh, same function and um, normal addition of some um, normal trend uh, of length x. Uh, so this is the, the data, the first visualization. And then what uh, is done is uh, uh, some splines uh, of different levels to, uh, to see how they fit the data. So you can see that uh, this is level one. This is level two, this is level three, to reach level five, which very well fit data, but can be overfit. Federico, okay. so yeah. the gather predictions is the one that will plot you your model side by side like this, right? Uh, the gather prediction is the function that, um, uh, I'll show you which. Gather predicts. Okay, because here I've done just the add to 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 have a, a little table. If mm -hmm. I uh, look at the entire uh, table, uh, as you can see, mm, I can show you this. This, if I do, for example, um, count uh, model. Uh, it lists the predictions mm -hmm. one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. So you, okay. you have the table, uh, model one and prediction, and then further on, you will, uh, you find model two with that prediction. So yeah. at least yeah, yeah. one okay. on top of. And then to make the, the visualization, you use facet wrap with var, uh, var variable or tilde, the model because you have this um, model variable which is oh, yeah. model okay. one and model. Mm -hmm. so you do a facet the the simple if i do just this uh, without the facet mm -hmm. uh, i obtain just one visualization oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay mm -hmm. so if i do the facet wrap um, it makes two plot based on the type of model mm -hmm. which okay. is this variable here mm -hmm. That's really nice, actually, to plot like yeah. the one without and with interaction side by side. Yeah. Mm. 
and so and here uh, there's a, a list of splines as well um, so you can see the difference um, one more the last thing I want to I like to mention is this uh, resources so the first one is study model if we go back here and then uh, so if if um, you go to this to this uh, tidy model star, put everything in the chat. You can find um, this get started tab, which is this welcome and everything, and you can build the model. So. There is a little introduction and then your audio cut out a bit. Uh, there you it, right. it sounded like something just disconnected or something. I think you're better. Let's okay. See. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you can these are uh Yurchin's data, uh very interesting. Um so it compares this data with other you know, with different models. So if you scroll this uh, and have a look now that you can read a bit of what is are all those things, you can see that use a geom smooth metal LM uh, to visualize the lines. And uh, then he decide to uh, predict the width of the urchins uh, based on the volume and food regime. Then he set up a linear regression as we did the last time. You know, we did linear regression and engine. And then you do just the fit. You do just the fit uh, with the formula inside and the data. For example, this is one uh, straightforward way to use tidy models with the linear model. So you do the linear model and then do the fit with the formula. And then you can see, for example, the coefficients in this way with tidy brooms, tidy. And then there's some other uh, reasoning here with the predict. You can use the predict function with the model fit inside a new data. But then, you know, uh, then one more thing I want to mention is that if you like to, to make formula with R Markdown, uh, Googling, you find many resources. One nice I found, I don't know who is it, <laughs> but this is nice. So as you can see, it, it tells you that, for example, this, I think it belongs to a course and this is a, stu a student that put all this, the things in uh, um, this uh, file. And so, as you can see, you put a dollar signs on both sides and you do an inline formula or you do double dollar signs for having a formula centered uh, to your R markdown. And then here are all the way to do these things. But uh, then as well, there is book down, which is very interesting. Uh, and give you my information how to make a formula. And then uh, finally, I want to mention this, which is uh, ggplot. Um, uh, information, the documentation about the geom smooth. Uh, and here you find all the splines, all the possible way to do uh, a geom smooth, which is uh, a straightforward way to do non-parametric analysis. So you don't make the model in practice, but you he does automatically within the, the ggplot. So you have a visualization, then you decide to go through the model um, formula and all the other things. 